I think people don't always realize that livelihoods are on the line, mm-hmm. right? Like a lot of times buying coffee really is looking at a spreadsheet, trusting that someone else's cupping score mm-hmm. is gospel truth. Yeah. And then making a, making a cost analysis based on like, okay, this is a 91. I'm going to pay this dollar amount. And that means that if I'm getting an 81, mm-hmm. right, it can be a, you know, half the price, mm. right? Because that just makes sense on a spreadsheet. Yeah. But people don't realize that, you know, for, especially for new farms, yeah. right? For new farms, all of their costs, they are trying to recoup mm. and they need to survive yep. to year two, to year three, mm. because they bought a D hauler. Yeah. Right. And yeah. you've got to cover the cost of the D hauler. Last year, I was um, doing uh, training in Myanmar. So we have a program that we call uh, What is Specialty Coffee? Mm-hmm. So when you're training farmers, okay, there are generally three um, areas to train. The first area is agriculture. Mm-hmm. The second area is the coffee product. That means what they do as well as what they don't see, but what people are paying money for ultimately. right? So the coffee product, how the coffee product uh, uh, shows itself in the world. So the, the brew, the frappuccinos and that. And then the business aspect. right? So as a farmer, how do you make the correct business decision? How do you choose the right person to buy? Yeah? How would you know that this buyer is not shortchanging you? How would you know to buy your own pauper? How would you know to start your own? So that's the business. Yeah. So obviously, coming from Singapore, I cannot teach the agriculture side because I don't know anything about soil, right? Mm-hmm. Because I don't grow up on the farm. Right. There, there are zero farms. Zero. Right? There Singapore. is, you know, there are some farms here and there. Uh, but I wouldn't know about the land. Right? I don't study agriculture because there's a whole, there's a whole industry of experts. Right? Okay? Uh, I wouldn't dabble too much on the business side as well because that has, means that you need to have very good knowledge of what's happening on the ground and how different, um, different, different entities are moving around the ground. Government once, agencies uh, yeah, and exactly. NGOs. Right? Yeah. So whenever we conduct a class, our class is on that, the coffee product. So we design a program to very quickly show the farmer over five days. Okay? Um, uh, what coffee looks like, right? By the time it leaves them, and mm-hmm. how their decisions impact the cup. So, for example, we go through, we we do like, what happens if you don't pick this rate and you pick that rate? And we actually do the cupping, right? Mm-hmm. And the first day is not even about farming; it's sensory. So we teach the farmers how to cup, right? Then the last day we teach the farmers how to brew, mm-hmm. and we teach them our extraction. So. Every time I conduct this class, somebody will always ask me, and these are all producers, right? They always ask, Sean, uh, which is the best processing? Okay. Right. Then my answer is always the same. Whichever one you have a buyer for. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Right? Right? Absolutely. And then after that, devote 5% of your energy, okay? Processing for a buyer that might potentially come. So you devote about 5 10% of your energy doing some processing that you know cannot sell, right? R&D. But, yeah, R&D. But you know, that, you know that some people over there are looking for a certain kind of fermentation. You hear about buyers. So you do a bit of R&D, so hopefully you can send some samples out. But you see, this is the business aspect of it. But the end of the day, your crop, you can't just like someone coming up to you and say, look, can you do this fermentation? Sure. And after he buys one bag, which is like mm-hmm. 1% of your harvest. Right? And then and then you got the rest of your crop and you can't sell. So the best processing for a farmer, you know, I always tell them is the is the one that is the one that, that you have a buyer for. Right? And if that buyer is willing to pay you, right, then spend at the extra five to ten percent R and Ding to see if you can get the buyer to accept a higher quality coffee for a higher price. Right? But too many times, um, very good-hearted specialty coffee people. They go up to farmers and say, look, process this way, process this way, process this way. In which case, I'll say, make sure you lock them down to buy your entire harvest. If you lock them down to buy your entire harvest and they pay half... Get before, a down payment. Go right ahead. Right? If you think it makes good business sense, but the point here is you need a buyer. So, so I think um, that realism is very important. Yeah, I, I can't remember if we talked about this on Let's Coffee yet. But it, it really happens where a farmer, uh, where a, you know, a very, very well-meaning uh, 
coffee roaster or a coffee company will go over to a farm, you know, maybe even from a different, you know, continent, fly over and say, hey, here's what we need. Here's a well, you know what I mean? <laughs> Build a well, make sure you have water. But we need you to make something that will score an 88. And we will buy this yeah. amount if it's 88. So the farmer retrofits all of his stuff. He's got water now. He can do a wash process yeah. and, you know, makes this giant harvest of coffee that lands at 86. Now he's made all this improvement because he used to be an 82. Right, he's been 82, now he's in 86. It's great, but that guy is not buying his coffee anymore, yeah. even if you know what I mean. Like, yeah. and and these are kind of the realities that yeah. that people right. really don't see. So, and that's where the the last section of the training, the business training, is very important. So, the farmer should go. Okay, so you want 88? Okay, pay for the well. You pay for all this equipment, and then if I don't get you at 88, okay, then can you commit? But it's above 85. Can you commit? to this crop at this price, mm -hmm. right? So the business training is very important for the farmers. So getting them to, uh, a good example of that would be to get them to say, okay, here's, we, we are chasing an 88, here's the price for 88, but if yeah. we don't hit it, here are the, here's the ladder of prices, yeah. and you commit that you're gonna buy it no matter what. Yeah, right. Yeah, or, as long as we Something that's certain. reasonable, right? Or you might say, okay, uh, if, you, if I don't hit 88, okay, uh, what will I do with the coffee? Right, so very simple, simple things. Because I think, I think, the reason why we are so careful about it, especially at Better Barista, where I train my trainers, right? Uh, in fact, just today I had a train the trainer for for seed to cup. Mm -hmm. The training was about the framing of how we say Arabica robusta, because you can't say Arabica is good, robusta is bad, right? There's so much good robusta. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you can say that because Robusta has two times the amount of caffeine, therefore, the best Robusta in the world will always be two times more bitter than the best Arabica in the world. See, you can say things like that, but you, mm -hmm. can't, you can't really go, Robusta is bad, Arabica is good. Because you teach that, right? Somewhere up the line, somebody. And we all know that Robusta farmers are getting squeezed already, right? right? Yeah, it's so, kind of ridiculous, like what? what green prices are for uh, for Robusta. Yeah, exactly. So so if we don't do things to convince people to pay for more coffee, right? Of course, sometimes it gets lost along the way, but assuming we somehow get the money back, right? People just need to start paying better. So I always tell my trainers, we need to be very careful because we don't know farmers. We are not farmers. So you can't walk into a farmer's trainer's training or just assume that you know what you're talking about to the farmers. And that's why I say there's always these three pillars, right? If a farmer asks you an agriculture question, don't answer. <laughs> like sometimes I know, but I don't, yeah, I, don't, but don't, I, don't answer. I don't answer them on how to prune, right? Some people will just try and give you whatever limited, but you're not an expert. And whatever you say, their livelihood is at stake. So you can't, you can't just, oh, because from another market, or I took a class somewhere, I learned that this is how you prune. You tell a farmer this is how you prune. Right? You're in no position to do that. So we, we don't do agriculture questions, and we try to avoid business-style questions because, again, we leave that to our in-country country, uh, in -country partner. Right? They will know the ground a lot better. Mm -hmm. But we can educate you about coffee. Yeah, I can teach you on the first day sensory and how to cup, and I can teach you sweet perception, and I can teach you how bitterness and sourness can modulate. And then on second day, right, I can teach you the difference between picking different levels of bricks. And then, right, but I'm not teaching you processing. I'm not an expert at processing. But the reason why I can teach you how the bricks affects your, your cup is because I have the coffees from this country, in Myanmar, or mm -hmm. from Indonesia, that is from the same farm, but three different processes or three different bricks level. And then the farmers taste. And they go, oh, that's interesting because if I pick like this, the flavor changes, right? And then after that, we can do three different processing and then I can have the same coffee from the same farm with three different processes. And then after you can do sorting and I will have the same coffee from the same farm sorted and not sorted. And then they will taste. But all that happens, you know, um, they are just going to know more about their coffee product, which is useful for them. By the end of the day, they still need the business training. They still need to know how to deal with their buyer, right? And that is something I feel that people who come from an urban environment or baristas, right? Uh, 
you know, uh, we're so sometimes so passionate about our craft that we think we can offer advice to farmers. But that should be left to, to the people who work with the producers. Our job is just to make sure our customers are aware that, that you know, these decisions affect our life. Right? Yeah, it, it's been very eye-opening. I've been working on a, on a farm, on a mill project recently. Yeah. Um, and it's been very, very educational for me to go into these zones. And uh, we have a forester and we have a ranger. And those jobs are completely different. Mm. One guy just knows about people and topography, and, and the other one is literally the one who knows about plants and yeah. biodiversity and how yeah. things go together. Yeah. And those are, you know, in theory, they're both farmers, yeah. right? Right. But it, it, there are, it, it's a vertical, right? Mm. It's like saying, uh, my foot hurts, get me a cardiologist. Yeah. Right, and we, we don't see that, that these are these are the steps, and it, it's a lot more complicated mm. than just oh, there should be no leaves around the ground of the tree. Yeah, right. Yeah, and you just saw a YouTube video, yeah. or you saw some documentary yeah, somewhere right. that says oh, this is how it's supposed to be done, mm. or you see a picture of uh, a drying bed in India. Yeah, right, mm. but. Those structures don't work in every country. Yeah, they don't exactly. even work in every in every mountain. Exactly. You can go two mountains over, and this one needs to be made of metal, and this one needs to be made of PVC. Yeah, and right. It, and so you need to have the experts on the ground teaching these kind of things, right? And and we all do what we can. So at Better, um, one thing that we did. Uh, a very big shift in the academy. So because Better has a lot of components, right? That's the roastery. And the roastery is constantly trying to make sure that their, their coffee is 100% sourced ethically. Mm -hmm. um, but then for the academy, uh, one of the big shifts in the last three years or four years is that all our programs are shifting to point people towards origin in a sustainable and responsible way. So the academy is trying to, to build up. Right now, we're about 60% there. But 60% is a lot. Eh? Yeah. So 60% of the coffees that anybody who enters an academy, we have the ability to pick up our phone and FaceTime the producer for you. Oh, wow. Right? Of course, Terry is not going to pick up my phone call. Right? She's probably busy. Mm -hmm. But the point here is that in the Green Coffee Foundation class, when we do the three processes thing, I can flash Terry's picture up and I say, I can call Terry. I can call Sam Singh. I yeah. can call Nate. Right over here, it's on our phone. When we see the videos, our videos are not very Hollywood style, they are just us on the phone, mm -hmm. but they can see the producer. Right? So, uh, our coffees for espresso, right? We'll say, okay, so this is my friend, this person, right? Uh, India, right? It will be Leo and Cat, mm -hmm. right? So, the idea is that you see, these are very important to enthusiasts who comes into the class. Because the enthusiast that comes into class, when they pay money to come into class, right, um, or the barista who wants to learn to be a barista, they think that they come in here having certain expectations. The so I tell my trainers always, be very careful that we don't transfer knowledge. Because today, any Tom, Dick and Harry can transfer knowledge. We apply knowledge and we help our students apply knowledge. So the knowledge must translate either into a skill or a mindset. And when you teach seed to cut, you want to blow their mind that there are people behind the coffee. You want to not just let them leave think, knowing that, of course, I know my coffee has a farmer. Yeah. Of course, I know that wash processing has this many steps. Boom, right? And they'll leave feeling satisfied because they learned something, right? But that's not what we want them to feel. You don't feel anything from learning that there are seven or eight steps to wash processing. Or you don't feel anything learning that there are generally three kinds of processing or Arabica and Robusta are the differences, right? You want an emotional attachment. You want their mind to be blown, right? So you want them to know that today you study in the academy, that we know who your coffee is. See, touch this coffee because there's a face behind this coffee, right? You want to study in the academy that, wow, today I learned that I don't think I know a lot about coffee. I thought I did, but I didn't. Right? Or today I learned that I need to really think very hard about how I represent coffee as a barista. Because at the end of the day, there's a life. 
going behind. See, so that's the difference between transfer of knowledge and the application of knowledge. The application of knowledge, when done properly, translates into a skill or into a change mindset, right? And like, I mean, ten years ago, of course, knowledge transfer was key. Now today, there's YouTube, right? That's let's coffee, right? Your barista can teach you about coffee. Yeah. Right, catch him at a at a time when he's doing brew, mm -hmm. right? When it's not so busy, your barista will chat with you for as long as you can or he can about coffee. That's knowledge transfer. But hopefully, people don't pay money just for knowledge transfer, right? They mm -hmm. pay money for application of knowledge, right? So for for the ability to grow, the opportunity to grow, and the inspiration to grow. Yes. Right. Uh, the inspiration to grow opportunity to grow to increase your capacity for growth right 